Welcome back everyone and thank you for joining us back in here. Our third keynote speech will explore how countries can choose their own paths in ebooks and audiobooks. He is not only the president and CEO of a global digital bestseller, Rakuten Kobo, but also advises startups focused on aging and technology as chief entrepreneur of AgeWell NCE. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Michael Tamblin to the stage. Thank you. First, I would like to extend my sincere thanks uh, for the tremendous hospitality of His Excellency um, Mohammed Khalifa Al Mubarak and to His Excellency Dr. Ali bin Tamim and the entire team of the International Congress of Arab Publishing and Creative Industries who have brought together such a diverse and insightful group of speakers uh, to this excellent event today. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be able to speak with you at the beginning of this week's events, and I know that we're all looking forward to the events that follow. I'm Michael Tamblin. I am CEO of Rakuten Kobo. There we go. Um, at our heart, we are booksellers. Uh, booksellers who've chosen to focus on ebooks, e readers, apps, and audiobooks. Um, and when we started in 2009, we believed that with ebooks, the rules were going to be different. Um, that unlike print books, there wouldn't be a biggest ebook retailer of the UK and a different biggest ebook retailer for France or for Japan. That this would be a time of global platforms. Uh, because the investment, the cost of building uh, and innovating in digital would be bigger than any one market could support. And we wanted to be one of them. So we are now the second largest uh, ebook and e-reader uh, retailer in the world. We deliver ebooks to 190 countries from a catalog of 7 million titles. And we do this as a part of Rakuten, uh, the largest e-commerce company in Japan, who acquired us both because of our global reach and our focus on empowering both retailers and readers around the world. And we are very much in that middle point between the world of paper and the world of screens with, a f um, with the focus and immersiveness of deep reading, uh, but with the accessibility and portability that technology provides. We were founded in Canada, and if you know anything about Canada, uh, you know that uh, the only way to become a global company uh, is to expand outside of Canada as quickly as possible. And that is what we did. So from the very beginning, we supported multiple languages, different currencies, and payment methods. Uh, and now, 12 years later, our sales are roughly one-third from Asia, one-third from America's North and South, and one-third from Europe. And as our markets have evolved, so have our products. We are one of the leading innovators in e-ink devices, pioneering waterproof e-readers, stylus annotations across different sizes of screens, and we evolve our business models, adding audiobooks, all-you-can-read e-book subscription services, um, which is called Kobo Plus, to more countries every year. And we do this uh, because uh, we are focused on fighting for time for reading against all of the other things that technology can try to pull you towards. We want to focus on the book. We want to focus on the story. We want to focus on the information that authors and publishers can provide. We have um, three competitors uh, that we spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, fortunately, uh, they're very small, and you probably haven't heard of them. Um, at least there are only three. So how did we survive? Uh, and even more interestingly, how did we thrive, grow, and keep growing with these competitors around us, mostly by doing things that they could not do. Um, not because they didn't have the resources or the capital, but because it didn't fit with how they operated as business. We focused on partnerships rather than on competition. 
We work with booksellers who want to sell ebooks while preserving their relationships with their customers. We work with authors who want to sell their books around the world without getting stuck in exclusive arrangements with particular retailers. We work with publishers who want a partner rather than an adversary. We also create global scale, but with local focus. The tools that we use to sell books, the hardware, the software, the systems, work everywhere. But we build teams and partnerships that allow us to embrace what is unique about each of the markets that we work in. And maybe most importantly, we only focus on books and reading. Um, we aren't trying to acquire a customer so that we can also sell them a television or a USB cable or a new phone or advertising. We just want to make a reader's life better, to help people find great books, to read on whatever device they own. That also takes advantage of making us easier to partner with. Instead of trying to put a bookseller out of business, we want to help them grow in the digital world. We want to grow with them. And in a world where most global content ecosystems are about using books and reading to attract customers for something else, it turns out to be a surprisingly good differentiator if you just do the thing that you're going to do. Being from Canada also shapes who we are. We are comfortable with distance. We are living next to a much bigger, maybe slightly louder neighbor. Um, we bring many different cultures and languages together. It also means that we don't assume that what works at home works everywhere else. We know that there's strength in flexibility and in understanding. And it has also made me fascinated by how other smaller and mid-sized markets work and how they have built digital economies on their own. Specifically the question, what does a successful market look like for ebooks and audiobooks? For those of us who live and work in smaller markets and countries, it can be tempting to look at the biggest countries for examples of how we should work or develop or innovate. But while scale is great, it also is a bit of a free ride. It makes some things easier. A business that works in a population of 300 million may just not work as well at 30 million or 10 million or 100 million spread out over a dozen countries, as some of my colleagues in the first panel pointed out. So for just a moment, we're going to set aside the big digital markets. They are important and they are fascinating, but in so many ways, they aren't really helpful to us as we're trying to figure out strategies that are useful in our own markets. They really do play by their own rules. At Kobo, we don't have unlimited resources. We can't enter every market at the same time, so we have to choose. And when we look at whether or not a market is ready for us, we're really looking at five things. We're looking at internet access. Do people have easy access to connectivity and connected devices? We're looking at literacy. Are people reading? Disposable income. Do people have uh, money to spend on reading? We're looking at the quality of personal reading. Do people like to spend some of that money on books and reading? And then especially for us, are there ebooks or audiobooks that are available in digital format that we can sell? Internet access is growing every year, and uh, there are many markets with high literacy rates, um, and more and more countries that have increasing levels of disposable income. But these don't all track together. Some countries have high literacy, with a focus on education, business, and technical skills, but don't read for enjoyment. Um, we tend to focus on markets where there is some population that likes reading for enjoyment, who likes collecting and buying books for themselves, whether that's for entertainment, for personal education, or for information. But even then, we still have to see if there are books that we can sell. Those last two criteria, personal purchasing of books and digital availability, are the ones that are most important to us. Um, and you will notice that population isn't on this list when we're trying to size the opportunity of digital markets. 
there are countries of 150 million that don't yet have the conditions for a good ebook market. On the other hand, Storytel is an excellent example of building a perfectly good audiobook business in a country with 10 million people. And Kobo has a very successful business in Netherlands with just over 17 million people. Disposable income, spending on books, and availability of content and digital matter most of all for getting a market like this up and running. Now, we in this room can't do much about disposable income for a country. That's macroeconomics. Um, and we can't change the culture of purchasing books. That's something that moves slowly over decades and is the work of educators, and governments, and media, and publishers, and authors. But the availability of digital content is something that we can do something about. And in smaller markets, and in emerging markets especially, and by smaller, I really mean any of us who do not live in China, the US, the UK, Germany, and Japan, we really have two choices. We can let our markets be defined by other larger markets. If you're a fan of totally free market capitalism, this may be the path for you. The second op uh, option, though, is to make specific decisions to do things differently, to make our own rules. That could involve private business, but also involves governments and industry associations and groups working together to decide what the digital future should look like and making policy decisions and creating programs that support that goal. If you're like Canada, a small country right next to a very big one, you think about these choices a lot. Sometimes we choose option one. We decided that we weren't interested, for example, in making our own cars. So our cars come from the US and Japan and Korea and Europe like everyone else's. We, um, but we took a different approach to culture. We made laws and built programs around music, books, film, radio, and television. We protected languages. We engage in a level of cultural funding, not as much as our uh, friends in Europe, but much more than our friends in the US, because we don't have the economies of scale that they do. We had to decide to have a culture and support it. And the same is true as we made our move into digital culture. And that's what has me so interested here, is in all the rest of the world that doesn't live in giant markets, what are the things that we can do to become healthy, interesting digital economies that reflect the cultures we inhabit? What's interesting is that because we've been working in so many different markets, um, we've seen many of these programs and policies at work. And some are supported by governments, some by industry, some are a mix of both, but they generally include some of these six elements. Wide distribution, the ability for publishers to sell books to every retailer, ebook conversion, the ability for publishers to convert their titles easily and cheaply into digital formats, the availability of aggregators and distributors who could collect ebooks into places uh, that were easy to access, the rise of self-publishing, um, as a service for individual authors, the availability of audiobook public production services to make high quality audiobooks available, and global distribution, meaning the ability for a publisher or an author to sell ebooks in any country where an author, a uh, reader wants to read it. I'm not suggesting that every country or every language group needs to be able to provide all of these things to their book industry to have a successful digital market. But I am saying that the more of these components are available, the more that a market has, the more control of their digital economy they will have. And the easier it will be to encourage better options and more competition for the readers in their market. A perfect example of this is the idea of wide availability. In the print world, a publisher sells to every bookstore that they can. And it would be very rare for a publisher to agree to sell only one retailer. But this happens all the time in the digital market and is a significant inhibitor to digital growth. We call it the convert and capture problem. Digital retailers love exclusivity if they can get it easily. It keeps other retailers from getting into a market. It differentiates them. And it keeps publishers focused on the needs of one retailer instead of spreading it across multiple ones. Almost every publisher here has probably experienced this at one time or another, where they're approached by a global retailer who says, we want to sell your books digitally. We know that you don't have the time or the capital to convert them yourselves. We will do it for you. 
and we will keep that digital version on our platform. It will be exclusive to us, but that's okay because the market's small anyway, and uh, we're just really trying to get things started. We want to help convert and capture. The problem is that when the next retailer comes along, the publisher doesn't have that ebook to provide. So they either have to convert it themselves again or get another retailer to do that conversion for them again. Uh, usually what happens is that no retailer ends up with a complete catalog of all of the books available within a market. That harms the publisher, who now only has a book to, available to sale through one retailer, and it hurts the consumer, who can never find all of the books that they want um, at one retailer and has to jump between multiple sources to find the book that they're looking for, or more likely gives up on ebooks and digital formats altogether because it's just too difficult. This can be solved if publishers are making their own ebooks. Not everyone has the capital to do that. Um, publishers can work with retailers but structure more aggressive deals so that they get their books back, and get them back more quickly, and government and industry programs can make that process easier and cheaper uh, for publishers to get that critical mass of eBooks available. One of the reasons that the English market is as vibrant as it is is that publishers did everything possible to avoid eBook, eBook exclusivity and make books available to as many eBook retailers as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, it is also, as Rudiger Weishbart said in the first panel, probably the most important thing that can be done to prevent piracy. As availability goes up, as easy access to books on digital platforms go up, piracy goes down. The thing that empowers publishers is access to cheap, high quality ebook conversion services to convert their existing titles and then building capacity to make their own in-house over time, with the goal of making sure that publishers can always control their own digital supply chain. An example, uh, two examples of this for medium-sized markets. In Spain, the Enclave project uh, supported the creation of thousands of e-books from Spanish publishers using government support and private contractors. Uh, it built a base of digital assets using, uh, that then allowed retailers to have a critical mass of titles from the very beginning to be able to start selling, um, making compelling offerings uh, to consumers. In Canada, the government supported the creation of a not-for-profit organization called eBound Canada. Their job was to select conversion services, test them for quality, and negotiate lower prices on behalf of the Canadian book industry so, uh, that were lower than individual publishers could get for themselves. There was also some support for conversion costs in the form of grants. As a result, both markets have deep access not just to recent publications, but historical and backless titles as well. Both of these markets were able to avoid convert and capture for their ebook businesses. Getting books made is half the battle, but especially in smaller markets, it can be difficult for retailers to reach every individual publisher to gather up their digital assets for sale. And small publishers don't want to talk to a half a dozen retailers one after the other, especially when the market is still small. So aggregators and distributors make that process easier and are very helpful for both publishers and for retailers to get the market going. The gold standard example in Netherlands um, is where publishers cooperatively own their print distribution service, Central Bookhouse, and they expanded that mandate to include ebooks and later audiobooks. That level of cooperation is exceedingly rare, but a version of it also showed up in Italy, where three of the largest publishing groups came together to create a digita to distribute not only their ebooks, but also to provide a platform for smaller and mid sized publishers who didn't want to do that themselves. Then there is the true disruption that sits at the heart of the ebook industry. One of the biggest engines of change in ebooks is the ability for the individual author to send a book directly to a retailer for sale all over the world. And what was originally used just by individual authors is now being used by small publishers as well, who like the easy to use publishing and conversion tools that self publishers enjoy. But what makes self publishing so important is that all of the experimentation 
um, in an ebook market tends to happen in the self-publishing space. Self-published authors experiment with prices, with formats, they break books up and they sell them as series. They're the first ones to try new business models. Um, and they are uh, you know, the first to try all you can read subscription services. They price aggressively. Uh, they move into high demand categories and fill them with new titles. And over time, they produce at a level of quality that is as good as anything that is published by a traditional publisher. And just to give you a sense of how much of a transformation has taken place, in English language markets now, for us, 20 to 25% of all of the titles read in digital are coming from self-published authors. In France, in Spain, in Netherlands, it's 10% and climbing. It's now hard to tell in some cases where traditional publishing ends and self-publishing or independent publishing begins because they are running sophisticated marketing campaigns, they are in direct contact with their customers, they hire editors and designers to make their work as high quality as possible. And what's interesting is that almost none of this commercial activity shows up on, um, in sort of industry reports, in sales reports today. Um, and because of that, I'll make two corrections uh, to the chart that my keynote colleague, um, Nicholas Carr, presented earlier, uh, the 78% of the book market that's in print um, has, uh, has two things that I'd make a correction to. Um, one, it showed revenue rather than units. Um, and so that sort of overemphasizes the value of print, which sells at higher prices. It was also only coming from traditional publishers. So it was self-reported data from the American Association of Publishers, which means that all of the self-publishing and independent publishing sits outside of that data, uh, which is why we more often hear numbers like 18% uh, of discretionary reading is happening in digital in the US. The only risk with self-publishing, again, is retailers try to lock authors into exclusive relationships, but that is changing all the time. Both Kobo self-publishing program um, and programs that we see across the EU manage to avoid this by giving authors back their ebook files after they've created it so that they can send them on to other retailers. And we add a high level of additional reporting and business intelligence to, so that authors can make better decisions about how they market and promote their books. The same is true across Europe. Almost every market now has a self-publishing company that works with all retailers and all authors uh, providing conversion tools and aggregation and payment services to authors so that they can create their books in one place and then have them sent to all retailers at the same time. What is true with ebook creation is also true with audiobooks. The same need exists to be able to do high quality creation of content um, and then have that delivered to as many retailers as possible. Audiobooks also, as my colleague from Storytel, Storytel so well represented on the panel this morning, creates access to a younger smartphone-based market um, that is accessing content at different times of day. And, uh, um, and so whether that is driving to work, um, doing the dishes at home, or, uh, or exercising, another time of the day is available for reading. There are the same risks as well. Um, retailers playing convert and capture with audiobooks. The challenge is that while an ebook may cost anywhere between $50 and $200 to produce, an audiobook could be $5,000 a title or more. This makes it harder for publishers to say no to a retailer offering to take on the cost of producing an audiobook uh, in exchange for an exclusive relationship. This is also, this extra expense has made it harder for governments to get involved in audiobook creation. So many of the strategies that prevented lock in in the ebook market weren't used in audiobooks. And so, unlike the ebook market, the audiobook market right now is quite fragmented because many retailers pursued convert and capture strategies. In all languages, um, either converting titles for exclusive sale or buying rights outright has created that fragmentation. In Italy, for example, no retailer has a complete catalog of the best-selling Italian books in audiobook format. 
They were broken up between competing retailers, and the result is a poorer customer experience all around. The last factor that I'll describe today is global distribution. If a publisher has rights to sell a book globally, they can truly let ebook retailers sell that book anywhere in the world. Just to give an example, almost every country in which we operate, at least 20% of the books that we sell are in a language other than the main language in that country. We sell Spanish books in the US, we sell English books in Sweden, Turkish books in Germany, and so on. We are also able to sell languages that are broadly spread out across multiple countries. A perfect example of this is our experience selling traditional Chinese content. This is the version of written Chinese that is most often used outside of China, found in Taiwan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, and Chinese expats and immigrants around the world. When we first started uh, visiting Taiwan in 2014, the conditions just weren't right. Many of those ones that I listed earlier uh, just hadn't reached um, the level of readiness that we needed to be able to start selling uh, content there. Publishers were still unsure about whether there was a real market for ebooks, and the books hadn't been converted yet. So we waited. We tried again in 2016. This time the conditions were right. Uh, publishers were ready, there were ebooks to sell, we had retail partnerships, we built a local team, and sales grew quickly. Then we started moving to other traditional Chinese markets, starting with Hong Kong, and now Malaysia, and Singapore, and now we're reaching out to the rest of the Chinese diaspora across many different countries, including the US, Canada, Australia. Publishers are finding sales that used to be very difficult to reach because physical distribution was difficult, moving books around was hard, finding individual small pockets of readers in each individual country was very difficult. Um, and now they can gain those same sales with the same digital file that they created for the home Taiwanese market. So these are the conditions that we look for that make up a healthy, competitive digital um, book economy. And like I said, these don't all have to be present. But the more that there are there, the better it is for retailers, for publishers, and most importantly, for authors and readers. The good news is, no one has to build these alone. Even with government involvement, most of these services involve the participation of private companies. For example, the aggregators that provide distribution services for small publishers in France, Spain, and Italy are run by the same company, um, the same service uh, provider, who's in Quebec in Canada called DeMarc. And the company Findaway is a global aggregator of audiobook who provides do-it-yourself um, audiobook production and voice talent services for individual authors and publishers all over the world. Where government support can be helpful is getting service providers um, uh, kind of connected to local markets, whether that's in the form of publisher outreach, supporting software development for local payments or languages, or supporting local staff. It's also important to remember that some things just take time. Like our experience in Taiwan when Kobo first began working in Turkey, we had almost all of the qualities that we were looking for. A literate culture with a strong tradition of bookstores and book purchasing, high internet usage, a rising middle class, but publishers hadn't created digital versions of files yet. So we waited, we worked with publishers associations and retailers, we came back three years later to find everything ready, including a retail partner and device distribution. And Turkey has been a successful market for us ever since. With good partnerships, a little patience, and a little bit of faith, we have the privilege of seeing another new ebook market emerge. And in the theme of good things that come to those who wait, I'm pleased to be able to announce that finally, uh, for the first time, Kobo's e-readers will be supporting Arabic starting in Q4 of, the, of this year, and that I hope will be the first of many steps to greater support for a fascinating and growing market. If I'm lucky, I will get to see many more emergences like this in the future. And I hope that this has been helpful for those making decisions about their own books and their own businesses or the countries and literary traditions in which they live and work. Again, my sincere thanks 
to today's organizers for the chance to speak with you. It has been my great pleasure to do so. Thank you.